Uh, okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Hester, professor at the University of Houston Law Center, where I co-direct the Environment, Energy, and Natural Resource Center, along with professors Victor Flatt and Gina Warren. It's my great pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker today and to welcome all of you to our ongoing series on energy and environmental law issues. Uh, I would like to pass the microphone briefly to um, uh, Professor Avon uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the program, its sponsorship, and up, uh, how we've structured it so you can have a sense of future sessions as well. Avon, take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Tracy. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our session with our guest speaker, Professor uh, e. Donald Elliott from uh, George Mason University. Uh, as Professor Tracy said, uh, I'm Oban Zawu, and I'm delighted to say a few words about uh, the program, which is funded by the European Commission through the H2020 and Mercury Actions. So this is uh, the last session of this program for this academic year. So we are fully grateful to uh, all our speakers, to uh, the audience, and also to the leadership of the Inner Center for the dedication and uh, for the tremendous support throughout uh, the program this year. So you can visit our website, www.law.uh.edu slash inner center, where you, will find, where, where you will find the upcoming events uh, in the series, but also uh, of the inner center. And you will have access to uh, the great lineup of our past speakers. You can use the chat box for your questions during uh, Professor Elliott's presentation, and we will be displaying the CLE credit slides, slides in due course. From now on, I turn it over to Professor Tracy Hester. Thank you, Aban. And I wanted to let everyone know that we will be curating the chat box as much as possible to make sure your questions get answered. But at the same time as well, we're going to reserve about 10 minutes at the end if you'd like to ask your questions directly to Professor Elliott. Uh, as Dr. Nazales has pointed out, this is our final session for the academic year. So we're going out with a bang. It's my great honor to introduce a colleague and longstanding fixture in the environmental legal field, uh, Professor E. Donald Elliott. Uh, He's one of those folks where if I started getting through his full background and resume, we leave him about 10 minutes to speak. So I will do him the grave injustice of just hitting some of the high points. Uh, at this point, I'll just note that he is a long-standing affiliation with Yale Law School, where he had, had taught as an adjunct for many years and is currently the distinguished adjunct professor at Scalia Law School. Uh, he was also affiliated with Covington and Burling's DC office where uh, he was well known in much high profile litigation and environmental consulting work. He also served as the general counsel of EPA 1989 through 1991. Uh, he's been very active as well with the Environmental Law Institute. Uh, he has also worked with numerous other large world law firms, including at one point he was chair of the worldwide EHS department at Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. Uh, and he also has worked with Paul Hastings Janowski. So uh, he's very well uh, familiar with the way legal issues crop up and get tackled on both sides of the table in the regulatory arena. Uh, with that, I also just simply say he's uh, someone that whenever he comes into the room, everybody knows him and there's always a great conversation to follow. So with that, I will do the most important moderator duty of getting out of the way and welcome uh, Professor Elliott to speak with us today. Thank you very much, Tracy. That was a very kind introduction. My, my father would have been proud and my mother would have believed it. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking forward to this very much. I have fond memories of the uh, University of Houston, which I visited in, uh, in person uh, uh, several years ago. Uh, I did put together a PowerPoint which summarizes my presentation. So let me try to share my screen and you should be able to see my PowerPoint in just a minute. Okay. It says participants can now see your screen. So that's good news. So my presentation today is, is really broken into three parts. Um, as you'll see at the end of the presentation, uh, a colleague of mine, Dan, Dan Esty, a colleague of mine at Yale, uh, 
and I have uh, put together a, a little book of about 200 pages and, and 16 uh, chapters on various environmental statutes and how they're different and what works best and what doesn't. Uh, that's too long even for today. So I'm going to focus on the AIR program as a case study of some of the features of US environmental law. And then I'm going to talk about what I think are the five best and the five worst things about uh, US environmental law in terms of lessons that other countries might be able to learn from our experience. And then the third, and for me, the most important uh, part of the presentation is at the end, where I'll be talking about uh, uh, our vision, uh, and I mean mine and Dan Estes uh, shared vision uh, for the environmental law for the 21st century. So turning to the AIR program as a case study, um, there, the AIR program has been very successful in making significant reductions in air pollution concentrations from many of the most ubiquitous pollutants that uh, it, it regulates. Uh, this shows the, uh, the progress, uh, but only as of 2005, in regulating the, um, uh, the, the ubiquitous pollutants that are regulated under the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And as you can see, there's been a significant progress. Um, however, and that, and that progress has been made without stifling economic growth. You can see that pollution numbers down here at the bottom have gone down substantially while uh, economic activity and population and energy consumption have gone, gone up. However, uh, the, the job is not yet done in that one third of Americans still live in areas where the air is uh, unhealthy. That's, of 20, that's as of 2018. Um, However, uh, this, this chart, which is an EPA chart, perhaps overstates things a little bit because here you can see that geographically, the overwhelming majority of the country is in complete compliance. And the counties that are shown in, in green are only violating one of the national ambient air quality standards, probably, uh, probably ozone, which is one that was made more stringent a few years ago. So EPA keeps moving the goalposts. Um, the, the biggest failure of the AIR program, obviously, is with regard to uh, climate change. Climate is specifically identified in the text of the original 1970 Clean Air Act as one of the goals that the AIR Act is intended to uh, uh, protect. And the United States has been committed by treaty since 1992 to take cost-effective measures against climate change. And as many of you know, in 2007, the Supreme Court held that greenhouse gases are indeed a pollutant that EPA may, may regulate under the Clean Air Act under uh, Mass versus EPA. However, you know, 15 years later and 40 years after uh, we uh, uh, passed the Clean Air Act, uh, EPA has still not effectively regulated greenhouse gases. There are some very minor permitting regulations, but in general, uh, greenhouse gases have, have not been effectively uh, regulated. And we have a case pending currently in the Supreme Court, West Virginia versus EPA, which will be announced shortly um, about the legality of the 2015 Clean Power Plan, even though EPA has said that, uh, it's, it, that it's moot because they don't intend to enforce the Clean Power Plan even if they could. There's an interesting uh, dialogue between Dan Farber at Berkeley and, and myself uh, about why climate change is uh, so controversial in the US, but not in the, uh, not in the UK. I won't go into that, but I, I, I offer those uh, articles if you're interested in the subject. Part of the problem from my standpoint with regard to climate has been what I call mixed signals or, or really schizophrenia emerging from the courts. Um, in Mass versus EPA, the Supreme Court said EPA could regulate climate but it has since uh, denied EPA the ability and flexibility to interpret existing law um, in, uh, in, in the ways that would really be necessary in order to, uh, in order to regulate climate. Um, the other side of that coin though, is I think in, in view of the conservatism of the courts, in my view, EPA has been overly aggressive and overly creative um, in, in trying to regulate climate under the existing law. 
Um, I advocated back in 2008 that we simply use the banal but successful national ambient air quality standards, uh, which is the basis for the reductions I showed you uh, earlier. Um, and unfortunately, EPA has declined to do that, uh, instead uh, taking uh, a really aggressive interpretation, which was largely um, uh, uh, developed by two of my two of my former students who were serving in uh, the administration and environmental groups at the uh, at the time. Uh, but I think if the Supreme Court reaches the merits in West Virginia versus EPA, which I don't think it should, I've I've written in the American Spectator that it's a test of whether or not conservative judges believe what they say about judicial restraint, because I think the case is is moot and and really shouldn't be decided. But uh, we'll wait and see whether or not the Supreme Court reaches it. Perhaps the most interesting thing that's going on these days, and I, I have to admit to a personal interest because I've been, I've been helping them with this, is a petition by uh, Jim Hansen, a uh, former NASA scientist, and Don Viviani, a former EPA scientist, to use the Toxic Substances Control Act rather than the Clean Air Act to, to reach greenhouse gases. And this was actually the subject of a, a very interesting article by Eugene Robinson in the Washington Post uh, just a couple of days ago. One of the advantages of using TSCA uh, is TSCA is designed to be a backup statute uh, and to reach situations which the other environmental statutes don't reach. And I think that given the uh, 15 years of uh, uh, unavailing attempts to use the Clean Air Act, um, maybe we could use TSCA. I think regulating, to regulating greenhouse gases under, under TSCA is squarely within the language of the statute, which is a point that Jim Robinson makes. And one of the other advantages of TSCA is it can be used to force companies to, uh, to scavenge greenhouse gases or, or remove them from the atmosphere. And while I'm not a scientist, uh, the scientists like Jim Hansen and Don Viviani uh, tell me we're going to need to do that, that even if we were to stop putting greenhouse gases into the environment, uh, they have a long enough residence time that the temperatures would continue to uh, increase. So stay tuned. I think that's the most interesting thing. Um, we've had some serious discussions with the administration. It's not on their agenda um, at this point, but perhaps it will be. So that's my view with regard to climate change. The basic structure of the Clean Air Act and what has been both the successes and its, and its failures are because Congress adapted uh, some existing techniques that have been developed in the civil rights movement, uh, which have been called bureaucratic legalism by uh, sociologist Robert Kagan in an excellent book, uh, to try to deal with the environment. So that's, that's often typical that uh, uh, we, we human beings as a, as a species tend to be pretty conservative and often try things uh, that have been successful in, in other areas and adapt them to new, to new functions. Um, the, the legalistic aspects of the Clean Air Act are a, a very strong reliance on best available control technology, uh, performance standards, add-on controls, mostly developed through notice and comment rulemaking historically. Um, judicial review by generalist judges, that's one of the features of the US system that is odd by comparison to many other countries around the world. I think Vermont is the only state that I'm aware of that actually has specialized environmental courts. And although we have specialized courts in many other areas, uh, we don't have them in the, uh, in, in the uh, environmental area. Um, Enforcement is usually by either going to court and getting a consent decree or seeking civil or criminal penalties, or increasingly through administrative consent decrees. And the statutes provide limited, if any, authority for addressing the problem by uh, fees. And I think, or, or what, are, what economists sometimes incorrectly call carbon taxes, um, but those are actually uh, user fees. More about that as we move along. Um, one of the strongest points of the U.S. system is that it results in very explicit numerical standards on a facility by facility basis. And if you look at the um, experience worldwide, many countries have uh, broad, uh, high-sounding uh, goals for their environmental laws, 
But those that are most enforceable in countries like Germany, Japan, as well as the United States, all have the common feature of getting things down to the uh, getting down, getting things down to specific, verifiable, numerical standards at the facility level. You can think about that as paying the transaction costs in advance rather than than after the fact. Um, oftentimes, uh, other countries have have had systems where the courts, uh, where the law simply requires that uh, 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 facilities reduce their pollution to a, a reasonable level. And then in an enforcement case, after the fact, the courts uh, decide, as in a nuisance case in the United States, what, what is and is not uh, required. Um, the UK had that system for a number of years, and they, and they uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, supplemented it with a, a regulatory system of, of rulemaking that's much more like ours. So I, I do think that uh, that's really one of the great strengths of the system. On the negative side, uh, the process is slow, it's expensive, it's complex, and it's legalistic. Uh, and those are not just my thoughts, those come right out of the air quality management in the United States report by the National Academy of Sciences in, in 2004. Um, Dick Stewart, who taught environmental law at Harvard for many years and is now at uh, NYU, is a little bit more pungent, and he criticized the U.S. system as an example of Soviet-style central planning um, at, at, uh, over the environment. What's really happened under the Clean Air Act over the last 40 years or so is there were, there were many uh, places where Congress was, was ill-informed or arguably wrong uh, in passing the law originally. And EPA has, has spent many years trying to fix the problems uh, through interpretation, particularly using its Chevron uh, discretion. And I'll, I'll give you three examples. Um, the first is banning lead and gasoline. Um, and as you can see from the, the slide, uh, that took 25 years. Uh, EPA started the process in 1971, and the ban did not become completely effective until 1996. So the, the system is very slow. Now, the EU didn't get around to banning lead and gasoline until 2020, uh, and it was banned worldwide in 2021. Uh, Japan banned it in 1980, so we were kind of in the middle, but I think it illustrates that even a pretty simple decision like uh, lead and gasoline uh, can take a very long system, uh, can take a very long time under our system relying on the notice and comment rulemaking and, and judicial review. Another example, uh, which took 37 years, um, is the end to uh, grandfathering. Grandfathering means subjecting new plants to more intense uh, or, or more stringent regulations than existing plants. And obviously that creates perverse economic incentives to keep the old plants online uh, longer. Uh, this has been uh, elaborately described in the, in the book, uh, Struggling, by, Struggling for Air by, by Ricky Rivez, who's a former student of mine and went on to be the Dean at uh, NYU and is a, is a close friend on, that served on his advisory board for a number of years. Uh, that uh, system was, uh, largely obviated and the statute was as a practical matter amended by some very creative uh, enforcement initiatives that were that were really pioneered by Bruce Buckite who is a good friend even though we were on opposite sides of the, the table uh, and he finally prevailed in the Environmental Defense Fund versus Duke Energy case in the Supreme Court in 2007. So that's one where um, fixing the problem uh, took uh, 37 years by uh, interpretation. Another one is regulating interstate uh, air pollution. Uh, David Schoenbrand, who teaches at uh, Schoenbrad, who teaches at New York Law School, uh, wrote an article uh, on the uh, anniversary of the Clean Air Act, uh, taking the uh, controversial position that uh, the Clean Air Act is in no shape to be celebrated. I disagree with uh, David. I think it is celebrated, I would call it successful, but slow. But anyway, David was certainly right that Congress's focus in 1970 was on local sources in the immediate uh, area as the overwhelming source of uh, air pollution. 
And in fact, over time, we've discovered that with many pollutants, uh, including the oxides of nitrogen, which we abbreviate as NOx, um, pollution can move across uh, uh, state lines. And most of the pollution on the East Coast is actually coming from the Midwest. Um, in my home state of Connecticut, we'd be out of compliance with the National Ambient Air Quality Standards uh, if we shut down everything in Connecticut just from the pollution that blows in from out of state. EPA is aware of this problem and has tried for many years to uh, uh, solve it. Um, I actually, in 1990, when I was in the administration as general counsel of EPA, I had a provision in the, uh, in the House bill which uh, would have given EPA standby trading authority for programs on pollutants other than uh, the acid rain precursors. And that was taken out in the, uh, in the Senate. Um, the Clinton administration started in 1998 to try to deal with uh, interstate air pollution through the NOx SIP call. The Bush administration strengthened it and the Obama administration uh, essentially uh, reiterated it. Um, and finally in 2014, the uh, EPA, the Supreme Court upheld the Obama uh, era rule, uh, cross state air pollution rule known as, known as CASPER in the trade. But again, uh, this example is a problem that has been known for 25 years and it took 25 years to, uh, to solve it. Now, one of the problems we have in law is we don't really have the, uh, the counterfactual. We don't know if we could have done any better. We know what happened, but we don't know alternatively what might have happened. And uh, recently, a number of historians have, uh, have invented a, a new way to look at things, which is sometimes called alternative history. Um, an example is, you know, what, what happens, a famous book, what happens if Pickett doesn't charge at Gettysburg and the South wins the war? Um, how, is, how is everything that happens different? And one of the principles of, of alternative history is you can only change one thing and then you try to imagine how that would, uh, uh, would affect things. This is uh, essentially a form of uh, what's sometimes called scenario analysis in which you try to identify uh, what, what factors uh, might have uh, resulted in a different result. And with regard to the AIR program and with regard to environmental law generally, uh, the alternative or the road not taken uh, is greater use of uh, economic incentives. Those can either be in the form of a, a, a cap and trade program or what uh, economists uh, call emissions taxes. Um, the great source of that is an English economist named Pagu. So those are sometimes called Paguvian uh, emission fees. Um, I've been crusading for uh, charges on the right to pollute since uh, the beginning of my career. My very first article with Bruce Ackerman was in 1982 in the New York Times. And you can see that at that time, uh, we were criticizing the Reagan administration for giving away the right to pollute and arguing that it should, uh, it should charge for the right to pollute. Um, we actually got such a provision into the Clean Air Act amendments in, uh, in 1990, uh, Section 185, which basically uh, required uh, uh, emission charges on polluters in severely polluted areas where the air was violating the national and air quality standards. Um, EPA seems to be allergic to such, uh, such fees. First of all, it tried to just waive the fee outright and then it got ordered by the DC circuit to enforce the law. Um, and now it gives states uh, flexibility to disregard the mandatory provisions of section 185 if it comes up with, an alter with a program that EPA considers, alter uh, considers uh, alternative and equivalent. In fairness, um, most of the pollution in the Northeast, for example, is coming in from out of state. So charging the local industries for their pollution wouldn't really be uh, attacking the, uh, the problem. But nonetheless, EPA has historically been pretty much allergic to uh, imposing fees. Um, in, in 2019, I wrote an article in uh, the Environmental Law Reporter pointing out that under a statute that's been on the book since 1952, and is used by many other agencies, EPA could in fact charge emission fees if it simply had the political will to do so. And the emission or the, or the fees that are charged by other government agencies 
run over $100 billion a year. So this is not something that uh, is uh, un, uh, uncharted territory. I have had discussions with the Biden administration uh, and have been trying to persuade them to use the authority that they have under the Independent Offices Appropriation Act to begin charging for pollution. So my overall conclusions on the Clean Air Act, and this would apply to most of the other uh, environmental statutes of which I'm aware, uh, is that it's been successful, but very slow. Uh, command and control regulation, by which I mean setting standards for add-on controls through the legalistic bureaucracy process of notice and comment rulemaking, interpretations and court enforcement um, is a very slow process. And one of the under uh, recognized advantages of uh, economic incentives is they, uh, they start to work immediately. Um, and so uh, you don't have the 25 or 35 year delay. We have had a very, a very successful experience with uh, uh, such programs in the United States, cap and trade programs under the acid rain program that was created by the 1990 amendments. Um, and you can, you can see the, the, the record that it re resulted in a 50% reduction in the pollutants that were uh, targeted within a 10 year period at a significantly lower cost than had, reason, than had been uh, projected in, in advance. But I think perhaps the most uh, uh, compelling reason is uh, stated in the last sentence. So out of the, out of the 15,000 EPA employees at the time, it only took about 75 uh, to get half of the pollution reductions during that, uh, during that decade. So imagine in a company, if you had, uh, you discovered that less than half of 1% of the employees were making 50% of the sales, uh, you'd want to figure out what they were doing and try to do, uh, try to do more of it. And this is actually a, a really old lesson. Uh, this is probably the most famous article in the, in the environmental canon is Garrett Hardin's uh, famous article in 1968, The Tragedy of the Commons. And what we're really just seeing over and over again is that when you give away access to resources for free, um, they will in fact be over, overused. Uh, and we continue to do that. Uh, we, we, we limit pollution, but with regard to the residual pollution, um, uh, we don't charge for it. We, we give it away and therefore it's overused. And you'll see at the end of this presentation that my colleague Dan Esty and I think that's one of the things that's wrong and, and should be fixed for the future. So let me transition from that to what I think are the five best and five worst things about US environmental law. Um, I think the, one of the best things as I've already talked about is verifiable and forcible facility-based standards. I would recommend that to any country in the world. A second is market-based cap and trade systems for pollution fees like the acid rain program, which I've talked about. A third one, um, which I was successful in persuading at least the Czech Republic to implement in its environmental laws, are citizen suits, what's sometimes called statutory mandamus, to actually force the government to keep its promises. Um, the, the largest polluter in the United States is the US government, and it is very difficult for an agency like EPA to regulate uh, other agencies in, in what is euphemistically called the federal family. So one of the ways to uh, deal with that is to give third parties, particularly NGOs or citizens groups, the right to go to court and get a, and get a court order requiring the government to uh, enforce the law. And that's uh, a, a, um, uh, an unusual but very effective provision of US law that I would recommend to other countries. A fourth feature, which has recently been adopted by the European Union, uh, is the use of liability as a backup regulatory system. There are provisions in US law and the, perhaps the clearest one is the Toxic Substance Control Act, um, which prior to the amendments in, in 2016 was notoriously ineffective. And yet when you looked at it, there were very few chem dangerous chemicals that were in circulation in the, in the US uh, but not in the European Union. And why was that? Because of toxic tort liability and uh, the, the use of potential liability uh, as a uh, backup uh, regulatory system. 
And the final one uh, that I would recommend to others is the use of quantitative risk assessment to, uh, to set priorities. As you'll see later in the talk, I'm not in favor of using cost-benefit analysis to limit the stringency of regulation, um, but I am in favor of using uh, the quantitative risk assessment process uh, setting uh, to, to, to quantify the benefits so that we can focus uh, our, our limited resources on places uh, where we can get the greatest benefit for, uh, for our expenditures. So those are the, uh, the five recommendations. The people from the United States always go to other countries and uh, try, to, try to sell them what we do. Uh, and so I, I thought it was appropriate. This is based on a lecture I gave in Taiwan in, in 2010. I thought it was appropriate to talk not only about the things that I thought we did right, but the things I think we do wrong. And so I think the first and worst one is that we put a, a burden of factual proof on the, on the government. And I've written a lot about this, but um, in general, the statutes don't do that, but the process of judicial review does because the government has to be able to provide a reasonable factual basis for its, uh, its action. Uh, the, the, uh, the government usually has to prove that a substance is hazardous in order to be able to get any kind of uh, relief rather than the precautionary principle in, in Europe. And as you'll see when I get to uh, where Dan and I think the environmental law should go in the future, I think that before people release large volumes of material into other people's environment, they ought to have an obligation to determine some basis that it isn't uh, hazardous. The other aspect that I think is uh, not so good is the use of non-expert judicial review of scientific and technical decisions. I don't think there's any country in the world that has judicial review that is, 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 a, is as aggressive as, uh, as, as ours. Um, and what is really pretty unique about it is um, the courts review not only interpretations of law, but also the underlying factual basis. And while they are uh, often uh, uh, try to be uh, deferential, um, I, I think that there's a good case that judicial review of the underlying scientific basis for technical decisions probably has, uh, has resulted in, in more harm in terms of uh, delay. It certainly results in uh, what I've called the ossification of the rulemaking process in which, uh, in which agencies have to uh, uh, consider uh, tens of thousands of comments and respond to all of them uh, uh, individually. Another problem with our approach is substance by substance regulation, regulating individual chemicals. Um, that's gotten less bad uh, in recent years as we've started just because of the huge volume of uh, chemicals that we have to regulate or pollutants we have to regulate. We started to use more of what's called read across and that is uh, uh, allowing decisions with regard to, uh, to, to, to one chemical to be made based on uh, family resemblances to other closely uh, associated chemicals or, or what EPA often calls QSARs, qualitative structure activity relationships, which basically models what the effect of a chemical is likely to be. Um, that's actually been probably more effective than uh, the substance by substance animal testing uh, that's mandated under the REACH program in, in Europe. Um, and that's because animal testing is actually not very good. I'm, I'm married to a PhD risk assessor with a PhD in toxicology from MIT. So we talk about this kind of stuff at dinner. Um, and you know, if you actually look at the evidence, um, uh, nobody would, would really rely on animal testing if there were much of anything else. And we're gradually transitioning to a new approach, which is called pathway-based toxicology, which is where we begin to understand how chemicals actually behave within the body and, and what processes they interfere with. The other uh, don't is we have uh, separate media programs at, at EPA. We, we regulate air, water, land disposal um, separately. Uh, this results in, um, in stove piping uh, is the term for it at, uh, at, at, at EPA. And one of my frustrations as general counsel is that uh, uh, my deputy and I were the only people that had, uh, that had really views across uh, various, uh, various programs. Again, that's gotten better uh, since, I, since I left in that um, 
they move the attorneys around from uh, the air program to the water program uh, and so on. And that has resulted in a lot of very valuable cross uh, fertilization. But I had a number of frustrating experiences where you tried to <coughs> borrow successful techniques from one program to another and were told you couldn't do it. The final don't is ill-defined goals. Um, many of our statutes uh, just really don't make, the, don't make the hard choices. And one of the reasons that they don't make the hard choices uh, is that um, if you did make the hard choices um, in, in the statute, it probably couldn't garner a necessary majority to pass. So in order to get things passed, we often resort to uh, ambiguity. Scientists often think the real problem is that uh, the statutes are not, uh, are not specific enough. And, I, and this is one of the reasons that I, I'm not in favor of a reinvigorated uh, delegation doctrine, uh, because I don't think it's really possible for the US Congress to make all of the kinds of policy decisions that uh, would be necessary to, to run a, a complex regulatory state. So that's the part about looking back. It, it is sort of the launching pad for um, what I call an environmental law for the 21st century. And this is based on an article that, that Dan Esty and I wrote uh, in a fest trip for, for Dick Stewart, one of our mentors uh, in the NYU Environmental Law Journal uh, last year. Uh, it's continued to get a lot of uh, focus and be the subject of a number of symposia including by the EPA Alumni Association and, and several, other, uh, uh, several other groups. And there's one coming up at the end of July at, uh, at Scalia. Basically, we don't have a constitutional right to a healthy environment in the United States, but we do have a statutory right to a healthy environment in the United States. It's declared in the National Environmental Policy Act, which is the same act that creates the, um, the EIS program. And uh, qu quite, um, quite mysteriously, while there has been a great deal of litigation over uh, EISs, there's been virtually no litigation to try to influence or to try to enforce the statutory right to a healthy environment. That's one of the things Dan and I note in our book, but I still can't explain it. Uh, in, in my view and, and Dan's view, uh, we took a wrong turn in US environmental law early in the Reagan administration when the Reagan administration uh, promulgated executive order 12291 in 1981, which established the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs to try to get more control over the regulatory process. And that executive order uh, embodied a, a net social benefit test for new regulation, which may make sense for most kinds of economic regulation. Do, do they create greater benefits than they cause, cause harm? But I don't believe that that makes sense with regard to pollution, where what's really going on is we have a right in a community not to be injured by others. Um, and Ricky Rivez in this article with uh, Kimberly Castle has done an excellent job uh, in the Minnesota Law Review of showing that there really are harms even when we're complying with EPA regulation. And Dan and I believe that polluters should not be able, should not be allowed to continue to injure others merely because the cost of preventing the harm to others would exceed the measurable harm to the, uh, to the beneficiaries. Um, and this is what we call the Caldor-Hicks fallacy. The Caldor-Hicks is uh, a, a, a technical test in economics for whether or not uh, a particular measure is efficient. And basically what it says is, do the winners win more than the losers lose? So at least in theory, they could compensate, but they don't really have to compensate. So, so, so the fact that uh, a big chemical company, it costs a big chemical company more to stop harming people than it would cause than, than the measurable harm to the people who are this is what we call in EPA land, we call them the receptors. I always thought that euphemism was interesting. We don't talk about victims, we talk about receptors. But in any event, um, we believe that uh, that was a wrong turn and, and needs to be righted. It may have made sense in the first generation of environmental protection as a way of setting priorities and, and, and transitioning from, 
uh, largely a, a state system of environmental regulation to what has increasingly become a federal uh, system. And in fact, um, I think we think that the general trend is to not have pollution controls be, uh, be cost limited. Let me go back. The, the 1990 uh, amendments to the Clean Air Act and at least some sections uh, specifically rejected the notion of benefit cost analysis as a limit on the amount of control that was necessary. I'm thinking particularly about section 112, which uh, establishes the so-called MAC standards for air toxics around, uh, around plants. So I think between 1970 and 1990, the, the bloom kind of came off the rose of benefit uh, cost analysis. There is an environmental statute though that has a number of features that we don't have in environmental law generally, and that's the Occupational and Safety, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Um, Dan and I, in our book, uh, and in, in my teaching throughout, I've always considered OSHA to be an environmental statute. Um, many people don't because most of our environmental laws only apply to the, uh, to the outside air, even though we spend 80% of our time indoors. And OSHA is one of the few environmental statutes that actually regulates the indoor environment. And unlike most of the other environmental statutes, OSHA does specifically uh, create a right to a safe and healthy workplace. And that's in what's called the OSHA General Duty Clause. OSHA issues a number of specific regulations, but there's also a general obligation on employers to provide a safe workplace. And in fact, the system that we use for workplace injuries um, has three features that we don't have uh, generally in environmental law. Number one, uh, employers have to eliminate hazards to the extent feasible not to the extent cost effective or benefits exceeding the costs, but to the maximum extent feasible. Secondly, under state workers' compensation laws, we have uh, no, no fault compensation for workplace injuries. And thirdly, there is an obligation on employers to disclose the science behind the risks that are remaining and that people continue to be exposed to. That's under the, the HASCOM rule, uh, which is promulgated by, by OSHA. And Dan and I think that those three elements are, are really what's missing from the current environmental law and, and what the environmental law for the 21st century should incorporate. Uh, an obligation to eliminate pollution risk to the extent feasible, not simply where it's cost effective to do so an obligation to compensate victims fully for any externalities that remain and externalities include not only harm, but reasonable concern over exposure to uh, uncertain risks. And finally, that there should be an affirmative obligation on dischargers to research, to, to research the science and inform the public, not simply to release huge volumes of material into the environment until uh, some, somebody at a university or in the government shows that it's hazardous. Um, and in fact, we think many existing laws do authorize some of those uh, additions. Uh, I'm working with an environmental group in Connecticut called Save the Sound to try to bring a case to establish the principle that under RICRA imminent and substantial endangerment, uh, there is an obligation to test materials before you release them into the environment, as opposed to only after the government figures out they're hazardous. I think some of the problems that we're currently experiencing with regard to PFAS and other substances um, as a result because they were, they were not adequately tested uh, uh, initially. Um, and Dan and I see this as a, a trend to, to try to develop all three of these things um, as, uh, as, as we've moved further into the environmental area. We started um, with some of it in the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments. But the Food Quality Protection Act of 1996 uh, adopted a standard not of comparing costs and benefits, but an obligation to provide reasonable assurance of no harm. Uh, and Dan and I argue in our article that that same standard, reasonable assurance of no harm, should be the standard across, across the board. And it made a huge difference. I remember sitting in, in Food Quality Protection Act uh, relates to pesticide residues on, on food. I remember sitting in, in meetings at, uh, at EPA, and I was just horrified that the EPA analysis uh, projected that there would be a couple hundred people 
that would die from cancer from the pesticide residues that we were considering to be uh, to be to be legal. Um, but the statute at that point talked about the benefits of using pesticides and comparing the benefits to the to the costs. Um, in fairness, Linda Fisher, who was the head of the program at the time, doesn't remember it as hundreds, remembers it as dozens. But either way, um, I think it's wrong for the government to uh, allow preventable harm simply because it's too expensive to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, eliminate it. And similarly, our most recently environmental amended statute, uh, the 2016 Lautenberg Amendments to uh, the Toxic Substance Control Act, specifically uh, repeal the standard of reasonable regulation, which had been interpreted to mean a balancing of costs and benefits and to exclude non-risk factors from being, uh, being considered. So it really is reasonable assurance of no harm, but in slightly different words. So if you're interested in further reading, uh, I've written about most of the things that we talked about today. Um, there's an article in the, um, in case Western Law Review in 2020 about the AIR program, which concludes that it's successful but slow. The five best and five worst things about US environmental law comes from an article that's available on, online at SSLRN or at the Digital Commons at Yale from the Taiwan uh, National Taiwan University uh, Law Review. The environmental law for the 20th First century comes out of this article that Dan and I wrote in the NYU Environmental Law Journal in 2021. And our, our broader um, critical summary of US law and environmental law generally is published uh, as an advanced introduction to environmental law by Elgar in, in London. It's actually very short. It's, it's actually written for professionals either in other countries or in other disciplines in the US. Although I, I did use it as the case book for my course at uh, Scalia Law School last uh, semester. And the students were not all that enthused about me, but they loved the book. Uh, and it's also inexpensive. It's 19 bucks as opposed to most case books are, are in the hundreds these days. Uh, it, um, it's, it's unique. I wrote an article uh, a number of years ago uh, reviewing a book called uh, about the Clean Air Act, and I called it the last Clean Air Act book because I was really thinking about how did the internet change things. What we've done in this book is we have a really short summary, but in a lot of the footnotes we have, we have links to where you can read more about a particular subject or what the basic materials are on the, uh, on, on the internet. And I'll just quickly show you the table of contents if this works. I never know if things are going to work. Um, but you can get some idea of, uh, of what, it, uh, uh, what, 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 it, what we cover. Um, and there we go. So this is quickly, I won't read it to you, but I'll just show it to you. This is a kind of a list of the things that we, we talk about. The Clean Air Act, Successful But Slow, Climate Change, Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act. Etc. And with that said, let me turn it back to uh, to Tracy uh, for uh, for your questions. And Tracy, according to my watch, we have eleven minutes yet left, so I did okay. Thank you all very much. It's been really a lot of fun, and I look forward to your questions. And thank you. But I'm sure I'm going to take up at least a minute segueing to the questions. So we will have at least ten for everybody. Uh, so I was, uh, we've set it up so that this is a period where if anyone would like to ask a question, uh, please either raise your hand and we'll make sure that you get into the queue or alternatively unmute yourself. But of course, as a, as moderator, I can't resist taking the, uh, advantage of the prerogative. Uh, I feel like we could take another hour just going through some of the concepts you've raised here. So lots of fascinating things. I'm sure one that's going to pop up in folks' uh, minds at this point. Uh, would be certain types of environmental concerns that don't fit neatly into uh, a, an economically based paradigm, uh, as well as they also uh, are sometimes hard to at least neatly fit in within some of the rights paradigms. So I was wondering, given your the concepts you've just outlined, how you'd fit environmental justice into the in externalities environmental rights approach that you've outlined. That's, that's a great question. Um, 
we have quite a long section in the article about environmental justice. And we actually argue that um, the requirement to compensate victims would probably do more for environmental justice than many of the uh, programs that we currently have, which basically require agencies to consult and think about environmental justice, but don't really have much payoff in terms of what they, uh, what they actually have to do. Uh, if it is correct, and I think it is correct, that um, uh, disadvantaged communities uh, for a variety of reasons suffer more from environmental disamenities or pollution than others. Um, then I, I think the obligation to either eliminate uh, feasible to the extent feasible or to compensate um, would, would be a second best approach. Um, I don't think financial compensation uh, really makes people whole but it may be the best we can do. There may be some circumstances, and we cite some in the article, where there are necessary products that inevitably uh, re result in uh, 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 harm and have to be allowed to continue, but that's not a reason to subsidize them by allowing them allowing people to, to harm, uh, harm others. I remember when, uh, when you, know, you talk about the difficulty of quantifying some of these things, uh, when I was at EPA and we were defending the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, which specifically, uh, 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 which which specifically eliminated benefit cost analysis and considering their toxics, people would would argue with me about that. And I, I had a young daughter at that time; she's now 38. But I used to say, uh, I used to say to people, "Well, just how much is uh, preventing my daughter from getting cancer uh, uh, worth?" So I, I think it is very hard to quantify some of these things, but I think uh, the rights-based paradigm, uh, which we defend, we have a section defending the philosophical basis for it. But I mean, the basic philosophical basis for it is that people in, who live together in a community have an obligation not to harm one another, even if, um, even if it would be more costly to prevent the harm than the person, uh, than, than the person would, would suffer. Um, now, what we do, uh, what we, what we, uh, what we do recognize is that some things like harming nature don't fit uh, easily into our paradigm, or eliminating positive externalities. Those are two things that we acknowledge in the article and say, well, we're not yet ready to solve those, but um, we we acknowledge that there are problems. Uh, and we're going to continue to think about them. We'll have a uh, we'll have a further paper, and eventually, uh, Dan and I hope to turn this into a book. But there will be a paper coming out of the uh, a symposium at Scalia Law School at the end of uh, July. Uh, probably come out next year, and we have a number of uh, really uh, expert uh, commentators: uh, Monica Ehrman, Ricky Rivez. Uh, uh, J.B. Rule from uh, from from Vanderbilt um, and and others who will all be commenting on on the paper, and that will give us plenty to think about. And we really wanted people that would uh, would challenge our our thinking, uh, and uh, then we'll try to respond to that and turn it all into a book. Excellent. Uh, well, I. I'm looking at my notepad and I have about seven other questions, but I'm going to hold back. And actually, we have a question posted to the chat box. Uh, actually, I was going to invite uh, Michael Dorson if you'd like to ask your question directly or we can relay it for you. Well, I, I thank you. Yeah, Mike Dorson here. So, Professor Elliott, thank you very much for your talk. The, the question has to do with if we have a federal agency that makes a risk assessment position and we can think of probably a number of examples of these where outside experts or other agencies actually disagree. How do you, do you propose a, some sort of a solution to bridging this disagreement? Uh, in some cases, the disagreement is quite dramatic and would have uh, you know, quite an impact on either people's health or, or the cost of a cleanup. Any thoughts on that? Excellent. Uh, 
Uh, I, I think that the National Academy of Sciences and particularly the Board of Environmental Studies and Toxicology played a very good role as what was sometimes referred to as the Supreme Court of Science. Uh, unfortunately, it became expensive and slow. Um, and I know that uh, Mike Dorson, who's asking the question, has founded a very useful uh, group for uh, peer review uh, through his organization, uh, Terra Toxicology. What, is, what does Terra stand for, Mike? Toxicology Excellence for Risk Assessment. Right. And so I think one of the things that Mike is doing is uh, just exposing that there are, are, are really broad disagreements in the scientific community with many of EPA's approaches. Um, having said that, uh, Paul Gilman, who was the Assistant Administrator for Science at EPA at one point, said to me, uh, EPA's function, Don, is to never underestimate uh, a risk to the public. So I, I think the EPA science process is biased in favor of uh, essentially doing a, a worst case analysis. And as long as the disagreements are uh, exposed to public view and uh, subject to judicial review and, and review in the court of public opinion and, and by the Congress, uh, that's the best that we can do as far as I'm concerned. But I do think you're doing very useful work in terms of uh, bringing out some of those disagreements. And I'm aware of situations, as are you, where EPA's assessment is 6,000 times, literally 6,000 times or more, more stringent than that of, uh, of other countries. Yeah, the recent one with uh, PFOA, perfluorooctanoate, it's a, a, about 100,000 fold different than the Australian group. So we have an issue. And just, I'll take an issue, uh, the other thing, I, I've been reading this book, uh, Don, on you know your book with um, Dan Esty. And as, as a scientist, I find it fascinating that you can go through here and I can understand some of the law. <laughs> so I, I appreciate the fact that you've done this and look forward to finishing it at some point. Thank well, you. Tell me the part. Tell me the parts that you can't understand, Mike, and I'll try to I'll try to do a better job in the next. Not not now, but you know after this, and we have another question or two. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, I'll ask one, and if time permits, we also have a question uh, dealing with international impacts as well. But uh, of my list, I think the one that I, I can't resist asking is uh, we're waiting for the other shoe to drop with West Virginia, probably maybe as early as tomorrow. And you mentioned the non-delegation doctrine as a potential issue that we're going to navigate. I think most expectations are is that this court is poised to at the very least strengthen the doctrine if not revitalize it in ways we haven't seen since the 1930s. If the non-delegation doctrine does come back and require a much larger presence of Congress in drafting statutes that actually direct regulatory action, is there does your proposed approach, is it something that you can adapt to that new world, which we might need to start thinking about? Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, what the Supreme Court is doing is developing what's called, as you know, Tracy, but just for everyone, what's called the major questions doctrine. And it's saying if a question is a major question, uh, it's something Congress has to address specifically. There are, there are two versions of it. There's a soft version and there's a hard version. The soft version says agencies just don't get debts, don't get Chevron deference to uh, uh, to major questions. And then there's a hard version that says Congress has to decide them. I don't think it would be practical, as I indicated, um, uh, to require Congress to decide all of those decisions. Uh, I just don't think it's going to happen. And I have written an article uh, in the American Spectator uh, where I basically say I think the major questions doctrine is almost as bad as the problem it's, it's trying to, uh, it's trying to uh, address in the sense that I think it is an invitation to judges uh, to uh, project their own, their own views of policy in, into the matter. Um, and I think you see that in the lower courts. If you just look at the major questions doctrine uh, in the Supreme Court, it, it's been invoked a few times. Uh, I think mostly, mostly, mostly wrongly, um, 
it was it was invoked um, in uh, the Brown and Williamson case, saying FDA didn't have authority to regulate uh, cigarettes. And of course, Congress then immediately amended the statute and gave them that gave them that authority. Um, I think he could have decided that case on uh, statutory grounds because it had all, all often been proposed to Congress and then not, uh, not, not enacted. But my own view is that the a major questions doctrine is an abomination um, and, uh, and, and, and results in, in some of the worst features of judicial activism. Uh, and I, I hope it won't survive, but if they start declaring that you can't regulate in, in major questions, and there's an excellent brief by, by Ricky Rivez uh, in the uh, in the West Virginia versus EPA case, showing that pretty much every decision that EPA makes would qualify as a uh, as as a major question. Um, there's also a very good article uh, by my my colleague at Yale, Jerry Shaw, called "Why Administrators Should Make Political Decisions," and that's kind of where I am on the subject. I think Tracy has uh, perhaps frozen, so. Robin, are you going to take over? Yeah, yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yes. So we have uh, one last question, which is um, which comes from um, uh, someone in the audience from Canada. Uh, could you please speak to the impacts of the U.S. environmental law on the implementation of uh, North American binational or trinational agreements? Uh, such as Canada, US, Great Lakes, water quality agreements? I'm not sure I really understand the, uh, the nature of the question, uh, impacts of US environmental law on the implementation of bilateral agreements. I, I will say that most of the environmental law statutes recognize um, the reciprocity uh, between uh, states uh, between nations in the United States. Um, I think that's tended to work reasonably well vis-a-vis -vis Canada. There, there are lots of uh, joint implementation with Canada. I think it hasn't worked as well with, uh, with Mexico uh, for, a, uh, for, for a variety of, uh, 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 of reasons. Um, but I think the way that we make environmental law in the United States which is really what I was talking about today is is doesn't doesn't really interfere with our ability to abide by international agreements, because the statutes, including the Clean Air Act, uh, specifically recognize uh, the authority of um, uh, 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 of the United States to enter into those kinds of uh, agreements with its uh, with its partners in in North America. That said, I think the culture tends to carry over. Um, and you know, one of the great expressions in, at EPA that I learned there is, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and I think when, when people at EPA get used to doing business in a, in a certain way, uh, it tends to carry over. Uh, and that's true with any organization. And uh, we could probably have an entire second presentation just on the Commission on Environmental Cooperation under the new USMCA. But sadly, we are now about four minutes over. So I wanted to, first of all, do my most important duty of thanking Professor Elliott for a fantastic presentation. And also, uh, sadly note to everybody that this is our last speaker in our series for this year. Uh, so I will uh, turn the mic to Aban here in a minute to wrap things up. But I just wanted to invite everyone that if you have suggestions or ideas for continuing speakers and concepts for next year, please keep us in mind. Uh, with that, Avon, the microphone's yours. Could I just say, oh, say sure. one thing? I, I'd like to say thank you, but I will also send a, a version of my slides to Avon. And if anybody wants a copy of the slides for the citations, when I was at EPA, Don Clay uh, once accused me of talking in footnotes. And I, as I was writing this, it occurred to me that that was really pretty accurate. So uh, it might be helpful if people want to consult some of the things that I cited, uh, if they could just send uh, a bond uh, mm -hmm. and an email, I'll, I'll make sure that he, he has a copy. Okay? Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. So just a great thank you uh, to all, all of us and uh, mm -hmm. to specifically our last speaker, Professor Don Elliott.
uh, we'll have the recording and uh, the slides post uh, posted on uh, the inner center website they'll be right. uh, available there um and uh, and one last word uh, we um, just you know uh, wish you all to have a great uh summer yes uh, everyone please uh stay safe stay cool it's a little brutal for some of us out here but i guess not as much in connecticut uh, <laughs> And we I thank you for your time and look forward to seeing you all again next year when we have further speakers to come. Stay safe. Talk to you soon. Bye now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.